Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is Jade, and this is How to App on iOS. And today we have... The master of utter jackassery, it's... GK Mac! So strap yourselves in, my friends. It is going to be a wild, fun ride. Let's kick off with a song by GK Mac. This is Kitty. Evening, good afternoon. Hope you're all doing good. That, that was Kitty by GK Mac, and I just want to play with a little bit of Kitty as well. What a wicked track! Um, cool stuff. So, as usual, all the links below to uh, today's featured artist are down below, and you can go click. There's one up in the top of the chat as well. I hope you're all doing well. Thanks for being here in the chat. It is Friday here in Australia, the end of the week for me. I get a day off tomorrow. Yay! So that's um, fun, and we got a cool interview coming up for you today. But first, let me tell you, we have a sponsor for today's show. Well, kind of, sort of. <clears throat> kind of, sort of, a sponsor. So I haven't really mentioned it this uh, week during all of the shows, but this weekend over on Camp GMA, there is a show happening, a really big production that has been a, a little bit of work going on to make this happen. 
And let me just grab all the links and stuff for you and we'll post it in the, uh, the chat here. So this is happening on Saturday. <clears throat> let me put that in there. Camp G Mays, uh, Stoner Fest Live. So it's June 3rd on Saturday featuring uh, Brad Example, April Dawn, Frank Terzo, Emperism, Robin Cheyenne, Mamsie Graham. There's a whole, whole heap of artists uh, performing on this. And it's not like one of the normal uh, shows you see on YouTube where there's a whole bunch of people on cam at the same time. This is performance, 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 performance. And then the artist leaves the show. And I have been asked to headline this show. So hopefully you can come and join us at 7 p.m. Uh, PST is happening. And it's a, I think it's about 14 artists, something like that. And uh, so if you can come along and join us, please... The show is the sponsor for today's show. It's going to be cool. Gmo's hosting it. I think Brad's opening up the entire show. So, you know, you want to be there for the start to see Brad kick it all off. And it's going to be really, really cool. Lots of great artists and all of that. All right, there we go. There is the sponsor done for today. Are you over? Give me some money for that, Gmo. <laughs> no, it's all good. So today's artist we have on the show. Um, so I forget how we we came about finding a GK Mac. I, I forget who it was who found his channel first, but it was it was either Russ or Brad or, or one of them two. And uh, we, we sent out a message. Some, someone sent out a message saying, you got to check out this dude. He's wild. So we all lobbed over to his YouTube channel and just started watching him. And you know what? He is. He's so entertaining. Uh, he's an amazing, amazing guitarist. That's the thing. We we were so like befuddled by his sense of humor and fun that we really didn't pay attention on the first view how amazing of a, a guitarist this dude is and just musician all up. And then the more we started to watch him, um, uh, the more we just realized, wow, this dude's just so talented. And then we found his music too and was like, wow, what is going on? So we've become regulars over at the GK Max show. I'll show you uh, during today's uh, stream a little bit of the wild shit that happens over there. Um, so <laughs> you, you're gonna love it. And once you go over and watch him, you just yeah. He he's normally he normally streams too around the same time as me, but I think he's changed his schedule. But we'll find out more about that. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to kindly give some round of applause because if you are a Wart Warrior in the chat, there is a. GK Mac uh, <laughs> emoji in the chat. So I've specifically put one there for you to uh, put in the chat. Give her a kind round of applause to my guest for today. I'll unmute him right now. It is the man of the moment, GK Mac. Welcome to the show, my friend. Hello, hello. <laughs> hello. Thanks so much for having me, Jay. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Mars Capone's already putting socks emojis in the chat. Um, let's, let's start. What kind of socks are you wearing today? <laughs> Actually, because I'm not doing a stream, I am just barefoot in, well, well you know, I'm just barefoot in sandals. You, you go I, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm just wearing these right now. <laughs> You're going bareback <laughs> today. For yeah. Going in raw. Okay. Today's going in raw. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know, uh, one of the features of your show is you have, you have a camera that is points down at your pedals, and every day you have wild socks on. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, because of doing live looping, I wanted people to actually, you know, I wanted a pedal board camera so people can see what I'm doing, that things aren't pre-recorded. A lot of people are familiar with live looping, some aren't. And actually, the socks thing actually came from an idea from my girlfriend. I, for the longest time, would wear nothing but solid black. Solid black t-shirt, pants, and my socks would be solid black. And my girlfriend says, hey, baby, you know, if you're wearing black socks, people aren't going to be able to see your feet on the pedal board. Your carpet <laughs> is black. All your pedal boards are black. It's going to blend in. Wear white socks. I had some, you know, you're right. And it stuck out. So I did that a time or two. But I'm like, hmm, maybe I can go a step further. I can get some of these funky socks. And then, yeah, it's it's been it's been funky socks ever since then. <laughs> It's it's such a small thing, right? But you know what they say yeah. sometimes: small things amuse small minds. And every time yeah. I join, it's the first thing I look at. 
I'm yeah. always like, what socks are there? And is there an emoji I can put in the chat to, uh, yeah. <laughs> to <laughs> sell the socks? Um, You're always like, what's the sock selection today? <laughs> and, but as I said in the opening too, like it's it's the, the fun and excitement of your channel that, that drew me in. And I know like our little group of misfits. Um, but once we start hearing you play and actually focus on what you're doing, I mean, the first time I saw you cut to the other camera angle where you've got the bass just floating in the air and you just start playing it, I'm like, what the hell? I mean, you are a multi-instrumentalist. So, uh, and, uh, well, two, really. <laughs> two. <laughs> that's, that, that's multi, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, I guess so. I don't think you, know, you can call what I do on that little drum pad being a drummer. So I'm like, a uh, two-ish. <laughs> You're a twice instrumentalist. Uh, so I hit you with a question. I hit everybody with, uh, what does music mean to you? Everything. Uh, in a single word without hesitation, just everything. I could not imagine my life without music i started on this journey when i was 14 and i went balls deep on it as soon as as soon as i started i was hooked i just it was all i wanted to do it was all i thought about my every step every decision in life that i've ever made revolved around music and being able to play music and being able to access playing music first and foremost um, yeah, it, uh, without, uh, saying, you know, coming across as trying to be oddly deep and cheesy, but to me, music is life. It is my life. Like, I don't, I don't know what else to say other than that. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's not the, it, yeah, that's pretty much all I can say about that. <laughs> can you think of a time in your life when shit was going sideways fast and music got you through? And was there a, oh. and was there a particular bunch of songs that that got you there? Do you recall any of them? Um, well, the time in my life, um, which is probably the most difficult time that I ever had in my life, was around the two thousand eight two thousand nine recession. Yeah, that was as rough as it got for me uh, because at the time I was still a full time musician. I was a full time musician playing, touring, teaching private music lessons until I was 35 years old. What ended that is at the time I was living in Phoenix, Arizona. I'm originally from Windsor, Ontario, Canada, border city to Detroit. That's where I live now. But around 2002-ish, 2003-ish, I moved to Phoenix, Arizona, got set up there, got into a road band, toured the road. We ended up living in Baltimore for a little while, moved back to Phoenix, played solo, the longest time and uh around 2008 2009 is when the recession really started to really affect working class musicians and um yeah basically i lost everything i had to move back to windsor ontario and move into my parents basements i felt like an absolutely beaten dog i lost my dream i lost everything i felt like a complete and total failure um, yeah, that was absolutely the lowest point that I've had thus far and, um, still had music, you know, I had to put playing on hold for a little while to, you know, get back on my feet, but there was, uh, I can't remember exactly, you know, just, there was a certain, you know, I had my master playlist <laughs> that got me through things that, you know, had a lot of you know high energy stuff as well as a lot of melancholy stuff when you're feeling bad and depressed and some high energy stuff when you're trying to give yourself that kick in the ass and get out of your rut yeah well uh, and you know i i know many times in my life music has got me through many many hard times but uh, i mean i mean there's so many times that music has gets you through the good times and helps you celebrate i mean i agree with you 100 percent. I, I always say you know if we could have if, if we could go back in time and replace anything in this world, I would replace the English language with music because it would we'd probably have a lot, whole lot less wars and a lot more drug addicts. <laughs> you know what? Victor Wooten actually is always quoted as always saying that music is a language. Yeah. yeah absolutely. He's, he's always said that. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a universal language too. Yeah, absolutely. You can... 
you can communicate so much through music. Uh, and speaking of, when you were growing up as a kid, do you remember the music that your parents played in the house? Uh, and, and who who were some of the artists that you, or family members, or you know the elder people, and how have they influenced you? Who are some of the artists, and how have they influenced you? Well, in my house, my parents didn't particularly listen to music too much. And when they would, it would normally be the radio. And being in Windsor, Ontario, Canada. Oh, hi, kitty. Oh, go figure. My cat wants to jump up on my lap now. <laughs> we love cats. Hi, we love cats. You, you know what YouTube comments are like when cats single. come on? When cats yeah. come on the camera, everyone goes bonkers. Yes, exactly. And the kitty's name is just Kitty. Long story. I can get to that uh <laughs> It's a foundling that just showed up and, and never left and didn't want to, I guess it's not that long of a story, didn't want to confuse it because we thought somebody was going to come by to pick it up. Nobody came by to pick it up. So it's just kitty. Hi, kitty. Hi, kitty. It was a nice kitty. But um, yeah, sorry about that. Where were we? Uh, music. <laughs> Got the kitty distraction. Yeah, music, music in the house as a kid. Parents. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. So being in Windsor, Ontario, Canada, Detroit being, you can hit it with a rock from here, yeah. um, a lot of Motown, you know, so my parents would just mainly play the, the radio and a lot of my bass influence got that uh, Motown groove from there. But when I really got passionate about music, it was because of my older brother, a brother of mine that was two years older that brought in Zeppelin, Rush, Jimi Hendrix yeah. and all this stuff that like I like I can't understate enough how much it impacted me when I first heard those records like the first time I heard moving pictures it was like you remember those Max L commercials here's a guy sitting down and the music starts and all of a sudden you know like you know the wind starts going and it's just blowing them away that's almost what it felt like for me the first <laughs> time I heard moving pictures and Zeppelin 4 it was just like where has this been forever? How did I, how did I not know about this? You know, how, how, how is this not, you know, a part of my daily routine forever? Like, oh my God. Yeah. But that was uh, when things really got kicked into overdrive. When my brother started bringing in those records. <laughs> I kid it. Sorry. <laughs> no, no. Hey, man, it's good to be distracted by nice things. <laughs> yes. Um, do, do, do you recall the first album that you purchased with your own money and maybe one of your parents or siblings gave to you as a present? Um, well, gave to me as a present, not quite, but like I said, my brother had those albums and he had a really nice stereo system at the time. He was a bit into like, you know, building and customizing his own hi-fi system. So I had access to his. He wouldn't give them to me. But the stereo was right there. If he wasn't around, it was like, yeah, you know, just respect the records. Here's how you treat them and not damage them. Play them whenever you like. So, yeah, and I, Moving Pictures by Rush and Zeppelin Four were two that I just played all the time. Now, the first album that I actually purchased with my own money, and this is because this was a sign of the times, was Rush's new album at the time, which was Presto, 1990. On vinyl? I wanted to stay with what was current. Was it uh, cassette? Cass cassette. Wow, like cassette! What a yes. thing of the past. I saw a video yes. the other day of um, <laughs> parents handing their kids cassettes to try and see if they knew what to do with them. Wow, children, man, <laughs> kids these days. Yeah. I'm a bit concerned after watching that. Video. Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, oh yeah. I mean, it's a tape. I mean, come on. And they, mm -hmm. the, the, yeah, they were doing some weird things with it. But um, uh, do you still have a bunch of stuff on cassette and, and vinyl, or or if it's, has it disappeared over the years? I have, um, because of how many times I've moved across country. You know, from Windsor, Ontario, Canada to Phoenix, Phoenix to Baltimore, Baltimore back to Phoenix. Phoenix to Vancouver, British Columbia, and Vancouver, British Columbia to here. And because of the digital age, I've uh, had to do a routine quite often of pretty much getting rid of almost everything you own, yeah. except for all that that you can cram into a minivan with all the seats ripped out of the back. So vinyls, cassettes, and all that, you know, became digitized. I uploaded it to my, um, you know, music library and then, you know, physically got rid of it at the time because of all those moves. But I used to be a collector. I used to have a nice vinyl collection, but moving back and forth across country so many times, 
Like, you know, it, it costs so much for a U-Haul or a trailer. It just makes sense to, unless you've got really nice furniture, to essentially give away all your own furniture, drive down to wherever you're going in a van, and just buy new furniture. It's cheaper. <laughs> yeah. I can empathize 100%. I had a massive vinyl collection in the thousands, you know. It was my pride and joy. Right. And But playing in a band as a kid and, you know, in your early teens and then the early 20s and and struggling to survive and keep the band going and the outlay and, and doing gigs and getting 20 bucks for a gig, those albums, I don't actually recall me getting rid of them, but I just think over <laughs> over a six-year period, they slowly ended up going to hock shops and to keep feeding myself. And then, yep. then one day I just didn't have any vinyl. I was like, what? How, how did that happen? Oh yeah, that's right. I'm a, I'm a musician. I'm broke, <laughs> you know? but you got to do what you got to do to play music. You know, it's that drive, I guess. Uh, and, and I'm exactly the same as you all, all that music. Now I have now in a locker, you know, on Apple and I can, I have it all back so I can listen to it anytime. It is what it is. Sure. I don't own it, but, what do we own these days? I don't know. It's less and less, it seems. It's all in the ether. <laughs> <laughs> what about your first gig? I'm always interested to hear what, uh, so, and, and not just a, like, you know, as a kid, normally, uh, mine was Kiss. I got taken to see Kiss as like a six-year-old. Uh, your big first stadium kind of gig as a kid. Do you remember that? Oh, Yes. Thursday, March the 8th, <laughs> 1990, at the Palace of Auburn Hills in Detroit, Michigan, Rush with Mr. Big opening for them. Now, I actually started as a bass player, and I didn't know who Billy Sheehan was at the time. I'd only been playing bass for a few months, and, uh, you know, Bass Player Magazine was always talking about this Billy Sheehan, Billy Sheehan, Billy Sheehan. Didn't really know, and... Talk about a first concert for a young bassist, brand new musician. You know, my idol, Getty Lee at the time, which was the reason I played bass and started playing music initially. And then getting to see Billy Sheehan on the same stage earlier that night, that was like a bass player's dream concert. Oh, yes, I remember it quite, quite well. It was uh, very life-changing. Yeah. Yeah. Man, what what an incredible gig. And, yeah, but I, I'm the same. I remember as a kid buying guitar mags and all that stuff and seeing Billy Sheen and going, who is this? I mean, I was into metal, so I kind of missed right. Rush in the beginning and then kind of went backtracked after I found Slayer and then went, whoa. And, and then I found uh, Frank Zappa and Mr. Bungle. Love Zappa. Yeah. Uh, man, that's that's my music, you know. Anything that's odd, oddball, Mr. Bungle, Frank Zappa, stuff that, you know, melts your mind. And stuff. I, I love music that I, I play to people and they sit there going, I don't get it. That's my music. That's my people. <laughs> like Primus. I remember when I first heard Primus, I played it to one of my friends and they're like, what the, what the fuck is going on right there? I'm like, that's all right. Yeah. You're, you're no longer, you're dead to me now. That's cool. <laughs> Less is more. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I remember seeing Primus at a gig here. It was the first time I saw them, and I, I think I took some kind of cocaine or I don't know, some kind of drug. And I stood right <laughs> at the front, right in front, and just, man, I remember feeling my body leave, like it left my body. That bass chugging through my body was so intense. It was it was a moment. It was a moment. Um, it took me an hour to get my body back inside the real body so I could enjoy Soundgarden later. Um, <clears throat> so it, so bass was your first instrument that you, you yes. learned. And uh, what, what was your first bass? Was it uh, Cheapy? What, do you remember what brand oh, it yeah. was? It was a Profile. That was the brand name of it. Ooh. And I remember two major modifications got done to it. One that me and a friend of mine did ourselves. Because the head sock said profile, and it was a cheapo bass. So a friend of mine uh, helped me take all the hardware, the tuning pegs off of it. And we took a belt sander, and we sanded the headstock and put some lemon oil on it. So that way you couldn't see that it was a profile. And it was a PJ setup, a P bass pickup and a jazz bass pickup was the pickup configuration. And I remember ended up buying some EMG. Yeah, yeah that's, that's the <laughs> brand name. It wasn't that style. 
It was more of a, a, a complete P bass style, but it had a P and J bass pickup. And uh, I ended up throwing, well, I didn't do it. I had my technician do it for me, um, installing EMG select pickups in it for a little while. Sounded a little better, but it was still a cheap profile bass. But hey, it worked. It was a bass. Yeah. Hey, look, it, it never does really matter, doesn't it? I, my first guitar was, a, I think it was called an Onyx. And fuck, was it terrible. But. It didn't matter because I was terrible at myself, so it really didn't matter. You know, it, 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 your guitar, do you think your guitar, you uh, move up a scale as you get better? Um, It all depends. Um, like your bass looks I, pretty mean that you're playing now. I don't know what, what I can't remember. Yes. What kind um, of... Well, what I love to do, and I'm a huge fan of, is buying cheap $200 guitars and basses. And then having my technician mod the living hell out of them to my specifications. Like um, Brad has mentioned he really likes my hollow body guitar, my ES-335 copy. It's a Glenn Burton. That guitar sold at the time for $199 on Amazon. It's got $800 of parts and labor in it. Pretty much everything has been changed on it. Bone cut nut, Grover tuners. EMG pickups, you know, the uh, Zach Wild set, the Tunomatic bridge with a LR Bags preamp in it and a uh, piezo pickup in the bridge. Yeah, you know, I just go nuts with modifying cheap instruments. And to me, it's almost like getting your own signature model instrument, but I'm not famous and I'd never, you know, <laughs> be able to get a, a guitar company to make my own brand one. So I just go to my technician and go, Hey, Jay, you know, can we do this? Like my bass, my six string bass is a Geo series that's like I got off uh, eBay for just over $200 Canadian. And it's got two EMG jazz bass pickups and an EMG P bass pickup on it. And it's got a five way switch that's almost set up like a Stratocaster, but in the sense that it's got one position that gives me what I call the super bass, both jazz bass pickups and the P bass pickup on it once. And that to me gives it all the low end that you need from a bass. But if I do something like a little tap harmonic on the 24th fret of my high C string, it'll cut through. It gives that cut. It gives that deck of definition. It's got that mid bite, but yeah. So that's, that's what I like to do. That's why all my guitars are, I have a collection of nine guitars. All of them are completely worthless because they're all cheapo guitars and I've modded them, but they're worth something to me. But the internet has opened, I think, a lot of eyes to the musical instrument world. I mean, for the longest time, we've been getting lied to. Uh, Glenn Fricker's channel, no, love him or hate him, right? He really does every week release a video to open people's eyes to that. We've been getting screwed for a long time. And you're absolutely right. You know, you can buy. The, you, like I lived in America for a short time. The first time I went to Guitar Center, I was like, Holy fuck, man, there's a lot of guitars here. There's a lot of guitars yeah. here. And there were yeah. so many that were so fucking cheap. They were so cheap. And, like, every one of them I played were like, oh, my God, why is this so cheap? Why? And because you're exactly right. And I think there's a lot of people out there who, who don't understand whatever guitar you buy, it doesn't matter the price. As soon as you take it to a luthier, that's when it changes. That's Yes. It, it has to be set up. You know, you can buy something for 120 bucks and go, Ooh, but it's a crap guitar. Take it to a luthier and it's all automatically worth 300 bucks or more. Mm -hmm. It plays like a dream, stays in tune beautifully, and it's nice and quiet and clean sounding when you plug it in. Yep. Yep. That's yep. all that matters to me. Yeah. I don't care about the name on the headstock. The name on the headstock no. means nothing. Does it feel well? Does it have nice action? Is it going to stay in tune? Is it nice and clean and quiet? Does it, yep. you know, then I'm good. Yeah, the last guitar I bought, my friend, is this thing here, right? It's a, um, this is an Australian brand called Artist, right? Artist nice. Guitars. And the reason I bought it is because it's got a, it's got a the Floyd? A Floyd on it. This thing, right, was, two, what is it, 290 bucks? The Floyd alone is oh. worth that. <laughs> The Floyd right. alone is worth closer to 300 yeah. bucks. Like, it's, it's sometimes actually, you wonder how they're doing it. It's a real Floyd too. Like, and the thing yeah. plays like a dream. I know I've had a few oh, people yeah. go, it's a bit of an ugly color. I don't give a shit. That's a great color, actually. That's a blue burst kind of thing. Everything I got else I've that... got is black, man. So at least it's yeah. something colorful. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. 
But but that's it. As soon as you, I took it straight away to to Luthia, and man, it's a dream because it, I know that company, right? See, the the artists are really renowned for having terrible pots because I've got two other guitars of theirs, and their pots die straight away. They just they just keep spinning around and around. But how right. you know you, you're paying like such a dirt cheap amount of money, getting the pots fixed means nothing. It's a no-brainer. It really, really is with these cheap guitars. Like the last guitar I just bought off of Amazon was a Fender Squire Bullet Stratocaster, one hundred ninety-nine dollars Canadian, shipped right to my door, shipping and everything. The thing is freaking beautiful. <laughs> yeah. I ended up having my tech put a bone cut not it's just what i do with all of my guitars i probably didn't need to and i had them install locking tuners i probably didn't need to it was still really good out of the box 199 bucks and the thing is plays and sounds freaking brilliant yeah we, like it's just we are living in the future or, or i don't know if it's actually that things have changed that much or maybe it is that uh, things have them the production has got better or we're just more we just understand more because we, we have access to more information about this stuff. But um, yeah, it's probably a combination both, of both. Maybe. Yeah, a little yeah. of both. I'm going to yeah. play. I'm going to play another track of yours, and then we're going to come back and say hello to everybody in the chat who's who's kindly here today. Um, would you like to pick the hello, next chat. song that, that out uh, of our list? Um, let's maybe go with my greatest non-hit, uh, SOS. <laughs> let's do SOS. Guys, kick back. Uh, this goes for, where are we, 317 to kick back, grab a beverage, whatever it is you need to. Tap your toes, be happy, do the things that make you happy. And this is SOS from the album Long Time Coming. And uh, we'll be back with you shortly, momentarily. Let's do it. Make sure I've got everything going here. <laughs> all right, we're good. There's the track all set up. And we'll see you back here in just a moment. Boom. <laughs>
are here today with a very special guest, GK Mack, and that was SOS from his album, Long Time Coming. Let me bring him back in the chat. What a wicked song. <laughs> Thanks. Glad you enjoy. Yes. And if uh, people are enjoying it here, on the, Brad says it was the first song that he listened to after finding out you had music on Spotify which is cool. Uh, and then we all went over and had a listen to it. And we're like, what the hell? Awesome, awesome stuff. Because on your channel, you don't really play a lot of these songs when you're live, do you? No, um, I, I I get caught up in the jackassery sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> the jackassery just goes and goes. And I do intend to usually like, uh, I will sometimes stop in the middle of running all the loops and doing the jackassery thing and play a few of my originals but the arrangements are not always set up so that you could do it with a loop station or with a, an acoustic guitar. But I got about seven or eight songs of, of my own originals that I could perform live. I should do it more, but I, you know, like I said, I just get caught up in the grooves and doing the jackassery and just, you know, yeah. So I want to talk about uh, school and stuff because I love finding out uh, about this. Did, did you have like in early days, like of, of you know your primary school, was there a music thing? Did you get forced to learn the recorder? What what was the first thing that you were forced to play? Um, no, no, actually, <laughs> uh, odd, oddly enough, uh, um, no, there was nothing that I was forced to do in in, in school or anything like that. Uh, Throughout grade school, you know, like in the States, they have grade school, middle school, and high school. In Canada, they have just grade school, which goes kindergarten to grade eight, and then high school. And uh, music class was not mandatory in grade school. So once you got to high school, you could take a music class if you wanted to. And by the time I was in high school is when I was 14, when I was already starting to play. And there was already guitar classes, and there was a band class, and I was one of the only bass players around, so... I got to be able to play guitar or bass, pretty much whatever. So, no, I was never forced to play the recorder or anything like that. That uh, just wasn't uh, wasn't a thing. Lucky you. My yeah. <laughs> my parents would have wished that I didn't have to learn the recorder. They bought me a guitar as soon as they could because at least it wasn't a, a recorder. Um, what about, uh, so did have you had any music lessons out, like uh, anything like that? Oh, oh, yes, absolutely. Um, where I live here in Windsor, Ontario, Canada, uh, Pete Palazzolo at the Canadian Conservatory of Music is who I took lessons from. It's, uh, you know, private one-on-one -on -one music instruction. Um, he has a lot of teachers that teach under him as well, too, but I got lessons from him directly. Huge influence, invaluable lessons, and as well, too, Throughout high school, I ended up going through uh, a couple of high schools that had a really good music program as well, too, and even an extended arts program through school, which was basically after school. On Tuesdays from 6 to 9 p.m., we'd go to this other school for three hours of basically free guitar lessons from uh, a guy that actually did session work for Sting and auditioned for Frank Zappa, and it counted as a credit towards high school. It's like, this is win-win. Three hours of awesome lessons from a badass session musician, and it counts as a high school credit? Like, sign me up, hell yeah. yeah and um, I had quite a few other private musical instructors. Like, you know, there was a, a few musicians that when I started playing the club scene really early, I was only 14 years old and I started playing the bars and clubs. There was a couple of musicians that I admired that I just kind of walked up to and picked their brain like, hey, man, that riff you're doing is really cool. Can I sit down with you sometimes and pick your brain, pay for some lessons? Like, OK, sure. So, yes, I, I did have quite no formal instruction. I didn't like, quote unquote, go to school. I don't have a actual musical degree, but yes, quite a bit of education in music. It does help. Um, I, I try to recommend, uh, especially vocalists, like, you know, I, I studied a lot vocals myself and I've taught. I know you've been a teacher as well. We'll talk about that. I, I do try and recommend to people who are like singing that they should at least get a few lessons just to understand how their, I mean, more so just to understand how their body works, you know, because uh, you can you can learn as many scales as you want and be all that technological and stuff, but that, that's not going to help you, I think, as a vocalist. It's all about the character. But if you understand yourself, like some of the best lessons I had for vocals were about like treating my body better, 
and eating yes. properly and understanding that you're you're a living instrument. So if you mm-hmm. feel like shit, you're going to sound shit. Um, and, and, you know, I, I'm sure there were probably people who went to that same vocal teacher I went to and heard that and went, what is this hippie shit? I'm out of here. And it's like, uh, you missed out on some very good information there as a singer. Um, now, you're a really a cool singer as well. Did you take any vocal lessons or anything like that? Well, funny that you should mention that because uh, when it comes to taking vocal lessons, you are 100% right. I ended up taking vocal lessons once I blew up my voice and I had to because I didn't do that. So I'm uh, I'm going to give the cautionary tale. I ended up getting nodes, nodules, because I was not a trained singer. I took lessons from my mentor for, you know, you know, bass and guitar and musical theory. But when it came to singing, I just tried to get my voice to produce the notes and I was doing everything absolutely wrong. Blew up my voice. Uh, actually, uh, one of my friends, uh, Aspie Loving on the Sea, when I met him about 25, 30 years ago is when I wasn't allowed to speak for three weeks. I had to take six weeks off. I was a full-time performer, singing, playing full-time. Uh, six weeks where I couldn't sing at all. And of those six weeks, it could have been the first three weeks or the last three weeks, I couldn't talk at all. And I had to go to vocal instruction to basically rehab my voice. So yes, I ended up taking lessons only when I had to, and I already had formed a lot of really bad habits, but I basically learned enough good habits that I wasn't blowing my voice up anymore. But yes, listen to Jade on vocal instruction all day long. Listen to Jade on getting vocal lessons if you're a vocal instructor. I wish I did before I had to. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it, you got to look after yourself. You know, there's a reason why the Rolling Stones are still going, you know, and still putting on performances yeah. like they do. Clearly, you know, these uh, sure, sure they haven't taken care of themselves with drugs, but that's all right. We don't we don't condemn here for anything like that at all. You know, do do the things that make you happy. But clearly, they understand how their bodies work. For uh, Mick Jagger, mm-hmm. definitely. You know, the guy can still pull out amazing notes. You know, and mm-hmm. that that's that doesn't come just from like random shit. You know, when I used to teach um, uh, singing lessons, the first lesson everybody would come to me, like a lot of kids and stuff. And the first song I'd give them is Georgia on my mind to learn. All right. And, and, and this was my test. It would be like, Hey, you want to learn vocals? Here's a song. And, uh, what we're going to find out where your range is. And so we do a little test to see what their kind of range is just quickly. And then I give mm-hmm. them, cause Georgia on my mind comes in many different keys. Many different singers right. have done it. And the, what's so good about that song is it has every single note in the scale in it. Right. So whatever key it's in, uh, that's matched to their voice, they're going to be able to sing it and walk away. But it was a test also to see if the person would come back the next week with, have actually learnt it and done what I told them to do, just to learn it and, and be able to come back and sing it to me. And most of the time people wouldn't come back because the reason was, I don't like that music though. And it's like, I don't give a fuck about the music you like. You want to sing? The music you like, sing this. Trust me, it has every mm-hmm. note in it and you will be fine. But uh, sadly, a lot of people didn't come back. They thought, no, what is Just this? Just because of the song. Yeah, well, what is this terrible a, song? Treat that song like an exercise <clears throat> if you're not into the, that particular song. You know, you're obviously a fantastic vocalist. I've, I've seen your performances. You've got a hell of a set of pipes on you. You know, um, thank you. So if, if, if you if you don't like that particular song and somebody with as much vocal prowess as yourself says, I want you to learn this song, there's obviously a reason. So if you don't like that particular art, look at it as an exercise and then take that into the art that you do like and enjoy. Well, as a performing artist, you'd know this. Yeah, like you don't always get to play the things that you want to play to make money. You have to mm-hmm. suck it up sometimes and play shit you don't want to do. It has there been an instance in your music career where you've had to do that, where you've had to do some kind of gigs? Oh where, God! Have you, have you got any examples? Oh my God! <laughs> like uh, being a working class musician uh, up until the pandemic, I was still gigging out every weekend gigging out regularly and uh, doing my looping thing, but doing cover songs. 
So, and I've always said this, like I have built a career off of playing a lot of music that I do not like. Uh, if you're going to get hired <laughs> and get paid money yeah. for playing music, you're not going to get paid for playing your record collection. You're not going to get paid for playing <laughs> your playlist of songs that you like. So, and knowing this and knowing that I want to get booked for gigs and want to make money, I my set list, 60% of it, and even though it's because I was a solo performer, I would pick it, I hate it, but I know it's going to work. I know that the girls are going to want to dance to this song. People are going to want to sing along to this song and so on and so forth. So, yeah, almost all of the covers that I played, there's some stuff that I liked and some styles that I like. But, oh, yeah, if you're going to be a working musician, get used to playing music that you don't particularly like. Absolutely. This is cool art fact, yeah. And that was part of the reason I would give that song out as well, because, you know, you're going to have to do this. I mean, could you imagine rolling up to a, a venue and saying, uh, yeah, I'd love to uh, work here. And they're like, ah, oh, well, here's a list of songs we want you to play. And you're like, what, no John Zorn? No Jewish extreme a saxophone player who play, only plays in Japan and has a very small fan base? Because that's all I know. Fuck off. <laughs> Like no dream it. theater? Yeah, no. <laughs> no, no, no 33 minute long dream theater song? No? Yeah. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. I'm out of here. <laughs> yeah. It's not going to work. I, I mean, I, I was yeah. a busker for many years and that, I, you know, we talk about many interviews. We've had a lot of buskers on here. Busking, man, it, it, it puts hairs on your chest. It's one of the most fantastic ways to understand performing live because you are dealing with people walking past you this close sometimes and they they get in your face and they want to play your guitar and and it, it's you never know what's around the corner some dude will come around the corner with a knife you know it's it's so crazy but it it, it really uh, tests you for being in a live environment have you been on stage before performing and had a total asshole in the audience who's uh, just oh. drilled you and and uh, how have you dealt with that kind of thing Oh, I've, you know, had this so, so many times. So usually when you're playing with like a full band, you're playing an actual venue that has some sort of stage. Even if the stage is only six inches off the ground, it's almost like it lets the drunks at the bar know, here is the line you cannot cross because the stage, you can't <laughs> go up on stage. But being a, a solo performer like myself, I would be playing a lot of, bars small pubs and restaurants where there is no stage there's just a little they take a table that's in the corner and they tear that table out and you just go and cram yourself and set up in the corner so there's no imaginary line of said stage there's just you can just walk up to it and there's always the the thing of, of the person that always wants to shake your hand in the middle of a song, oh, especially yeah. if you're in a guitar solo <laughs> or the person that wants to carry on a full conversation with you when you're in the middle of singing a song and you're just taking your eyes and you're just kind of taking your eyes and like moving them towards the mic. Like I can't answer your question. I'm in the middle of singing a verse right now. <laughs> and that happens a lot as the solo performer. People feel like they can just come right up. Like I say, is with the full band stuff, like I said, even if that stage is only six inches off the ground, they just know I I, I can't walk past there. It kind of gives them that little yep. boundary. Yeah. Um, I, I haven't said hello to everybody in the audience today. Let's do that now. And um, so it's thank good. you all for being here. Too. We've got uh, Thomas Christ is here. Thank De you. Dennis Ellis, The Mix Club. Uh, who else do we have? Gregory Sullivan, uh, Russ8889. Leela's Ooh. here, Kim Harden Hudson. Say hello. Just type something in the chat for me, guys, so I can call out your name because uh, we, we love our call outs. Who else do I see here in the list? Um, I think I saw Joe Glenn. We've got Brad Example, of course. We've got Jerry Gomes down here, another great artist. We've got SM Borthwick. There's Joe Glenn. We've got Brad Example, as I just said. Uh, who else? Let's see. Thank you guys for typing something so I don't have to scroll up. There was Conspiracy Media. We had Princess LDG here. So uh, Cold Acre I saw as well. Dan Eckberg. Uh, who else? Uh, do, 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 do. Ooh, I think I've got... There's Happy Ron was here. Saw Pete Johns at the start of the show as well. If I've missed you, I do uh, apologize. There's Michael Nervous. Hello to you, my friend. Hugh Caldwell, what's happening to you? You just released a song I saw yesterday. Great stuff. 
Awesome. All right, let's uh, continue on. So uh, now with gigs, so we, what was your first? Yeah, you've obviously had bands as well, yeah? Am I right? Oh, yeah. What was your first, oh, band, yeah. first band name? Oh, I think the first <laughs> band, uh, I think we went by Known By Name, <laughs> ironically enough. <laughs> Yeah, nineteen ninety. Of course. 1990, of yeah. course. <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah, yeah. We were called known by name because we just couldn't come up with anything else. <laughs> of course, I was nineteen ninety, um, uh, like summer of nineteen ninety. I would say, and um, I can still remember the first bar gig that we did, and the first gig that we did. I'll, I'll never forget it. My mom gives me and the drummer a ride to the show. <laughs> and it's it, it, it's it's in downtown Windsor. The bar has been gone for like thirty years now. It was a bar called Stanley's. I'll never forget this. My mom gives me and the drummer a ride, and as soon as we pull up, we're going to get. You know, my drummer had to bring like a snare drum and cymbals. I had to bring just you know my bass. We were doing just one set, you know. Um, and you know they had you know amps and most of the kit. And as we're getting the stuff out of the car. My mom's sitting there saying, you know, good luck. These two skinheads walk out of the bar with beers in their hands, lean up against the wall, light up a joint, smoke it, and start passing it. And right away, my mom's like, I don't think this is a good idea. I don't think you should go in. They're like, nah, it's going to be fine, mom. Don't worry about it. We got the gig. And um, did one set. Made ten dollars in a pitcher of beer, and I thought that was the coolest fucking thing ever. <laughs> I thought it was just the greatest thing ever. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm guessing like it, it's the same around the world. Yeah, like I I played so many bars where the owners at the end uh, promise you the world, and then they come up to you at the end and say, "Oh, we can't pay you. Sorry, we we." We didn't have enough people. I've I've been paid in T-shirts. I've been paid in beer. One venue, I think I disclosed in the interview, I had where Brad interviewed me. We used to get acid trips given to us, and then we'd go sell them back around our our home area to make the money back. After we took a few, <laughs> that that got a bit dangerous because we started taking more than what we were selling. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, awesome! But you know, you, you face this. You know, it's all not rock and roll, and you know, girls right. and, and lots of money, and and pe as you mentioned before, people talking the fuck over the top of you, and you're like, Jesus Christ, man, what are you here for? But what are you going to do? You know, that's, that that is yeah. the real rock and roll. The the that's that's doing the 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 bit. So you you move from playing in bands to doing solo stuff. Yes. Um. Well. Hang on. So we're, let's talk about, I just want to bounce back. So your release is here. Let me bring this up on the screen. Um, you've got two albums out. Here we mm. go. So you've got two albums out that you can get online. This was the, this is the first one, The Past, in 2006. How did this album come about? And was, Did you have a band for this, or is it, this all just you? Solo act. So actually, The Past is actually a compilation of two five-song EPs that are now out of print. That uh, Actually, the first five tracks of it, tracks one through five, were from an EP from 2000, and tracks six through ten were from a five-song EP in 2002, out of print. So I put them together on the past, because I'm not really creative when it comes to naming things. It was old music, so I called it the past. <laughs> and the next album that came out that took me 20 years to release was called Long time coming. Again, I'm not that creative when it comes to naming things. <laughs> the cat's name is Kitty. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you don't have to be, man. It makes sense. Like, it, it, that, it makes total sense. Like, you know, yeah. I should change it in the name of my, my, my album that I've been working on. has been like 10 years in the making. I should call it Long Time Forever Coming. It's never yeah. going to come. Um, so how did you record these albums? Like, is this, do, do you record this in your, uh, did you go to a studio to do these? Is this home recording to put these together? Well, um, the first two five song EPs yeah. were recorded in an actual studio that ended up becoming the past. And then they ended up being, you know, put into that full length release of the past that was actually recorded in an actual studio, but long time coming 
was recorded in the studio that you see here, but it was all recorded here. Um, but it went to an actual studio to have guitars reamped with nice tube amps, you know, like a, a a plexi for all the high gain stuff and a Fender Twin for all the clean guitar stuff and mixing and mastering. So like the way I record, because I am not an audio engineer, I am not somebody like you, Jade, that, you know, is a legit engineer. That is its own art form. I stake no claims to I'm that. I'm not either. <laughs> I'm just a home fucker like everyone else. But you're really good at it. You put out, I hear some of the stuff that you've produced sounds good. My mixes are absolute garbage. But what I do is I record what I call idiot-proof recording. I use an electronic drum kit, which gets, you know, for MIDI, MIDI for the drums, but I don't hit the quantize button. It's an actual human drummer, myself or a drummer that I'll have come in. And I record all guitars and basses are DI tracks. Just straight DI tracks, so that way it can be reamped in an actual studio by an actual engineer that actually knows what the hell they're doing. <laughs> you know, I just get the levels, you know, not too high, not too low, get my levels good, clean DI tracks. I deliver them to the engineer. Hey, these are clean. I can work with them. But that is the secret to making recording good music. You know, all, all the, the EQ and all that stuff, all, all, it's all subjective. The most important mm -hmm. thing to get down is clean recordings, mm -hmm. clean wave files that are not peaking, not too low and just enough. Yes. You know, and that is it. That is it. And your MIDI mm -hmm. files and you, you're good. Everything else is just stuff you can watch on YouTube to learn in, in, in 25 minutes. Yep. Pretty much, you know, and it's yeah. all, all subjective at the end of the day a anyway. So, um, I mean, you know, it, your stuff sounds wicked. So, you know, I, you. so you're doing the right thing. Absolutely. And um, it, it was, I'm going to, we're going to jump over to your channel now. Uh, let's, yeah, look, Russ says EQ, what's that? Russ's music <laughs> is amazing and he hardly uses any EQ on all of his stuff. Really? He just, I think there's. There's a lot of merit in what I've had Russ on the show a bunch of times talking about the way he produces music. And I think there's merit to this that people get so <clears throat> locked down into trying to understand compression and EQ and all this shit, right? But I and and they look at it, they're looking at EQ and compression as something to fix, to fix the recording that they're doing and that's not the case if you understand the instruments that you're putting in and recording and your vocal takes and you're getting clean takes it's sh you should need fuck all compression and fuck all eq and russ does it really well with a lot of the synths that he uses he chooses synth sounds that complement each other eq wise already so that's why he doesn't use a lot of eq but there's a lot of people who watch a lot of tutorials and get sucked into this thing of like, but I need right. to understand compression 100%. It's like, no, you don't. Just just understand right. putting in a clean recording. If you can make a, if you can sit in front of a, yeah, a home studio desk, an iPad, an Android device, a PC, whatever it is, and get put in a bunch of tracks and just mix them, turn the, move the sliders a little bit and make it sound great without anything. You're on fire. That's the most important thing. Then you just add the color at the end, you know, and, and right. very minimal. I'm, I'm going to jump over now to YouTube. Let's do this. Um, uh, why is YouTube showing some weird stuff here? All right. I don't know why YouTube's doing this at the moment. Let's um, do this. Man, this update from YouTube is really terrible. I don't know what's going on here. Let's try shutting this down. It was working before. Uh, okay, um, let's shut YouTube down completely. Wow, the YouTube app is, there we go, now it's back. Uh, let me do a, go over here, and where were we, library, sorry about this. Let's just, no drop, let's just drop the needle up here. It comes up for a second, but then it automatically resets. I've played with so many settings, it doesn't keep whatever anybody said before, with the exception of the uh, live streamer cafe chat. Yes, yes. Hello, dancers. Hello, Jackie. I'm doing very, 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 very fine right now. I'm doing even better now. Now that I'm rocking out and that you're here. So, yes. So, yes. Folks, this is a live stream. 
I've just I've dropped the Wonderful needle randomly. Still out there, holler and say, what's up? Hello. <laughs> Jackie, love Jack. Welcome back to the show. I always love to see you. And this, you know, you know. Jackie, love Jack. Welcome back to the show. Always welcome. I always love to see you. And this, you know, you should. Know. Jackie. Love Shack, welcome back to the show. Always welcome, always love to see you. And this, you know, you show. Jackie Love Shack, welcome back to the show. Taco sauce. Always love, always nice to see you. Know you should. Jackie Love Shack, welcome back to the show. Always welcome, always love to see you. And this, you know, you show. Jackie Love Shack, welcome back to the show. Always welcome, always love to see you. Know. Jackie, Who doesn't love Love Shack? Sometimes it's great, other times, eh. <laughs> it's always great. Like it's, it's so much fun, and yeah, we've got. Luckily here, I can zoom in on sock cam. There we go. There we go. <laughs> There's sock cam. Taco socks. <laughs> Taco was the selection of the day. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's interesting, you know, because we, as I said earlier, we watch, and we're having so much fun that sometimes you forget what you're doing on the guitar is just. You just smashing the fuck out of it, <laughs> you know. So we got a couple of new subscribers here. Dennis says I've subscribed now, and Jerry nice. subscribed. Good. Hopefully Thanks we'll, so much. Hopefully we'll see you over there because it's it's fun. As soon as you go live, we're there every every show now. I see if I can find. Let me do some scrolling. I want to. I want to see if I can get get a moment when you're on the bass. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Check this out, guys. So much fun. Did you just moonwalk then? Um, <laughs> Look like I it. guess so. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> yeah, I did say earlier, just before a new viewer came in, audible video, that I was going to do a little bit of bass. And Sid's here. Sid wants some bass, so I got good old Black Beauty, my six-string bass over here. Want a little bass? As requested.
Fuck yeah. Out of me. You're just looking away somewhere else. <laughs> well, I was actually trying to look at uh, my, my screen where I could see the comments and everything, so I can keep up with the comments. Because I had to turn that way to do that, so I'm yeah. just and looking over to see if I'm missing anything on the comments. And still yet. just, but I'm just playing <laughs> note perfect. Like what the hell? <laughs> it's so much fun. We'll, we'll play a little bit more. As you can see, folks, this is the reason why we have this amazing artist on here today. We've become addicted to your shows, a group of us, and hopefully other people will as well after seeing that. And, you know, I just dropped a needle, as they say. I think that was your last live stream. I could drop a needle anywhere in there. And I, I love coming in there because, you know, you, you greet everybody with a song. You know, I, I come in there and the first, as soon as I write something, it's like, hey, there's Jade. Jade, how's it going? I hope you're doing okay. <laughs> and I'm, I'm just automatically, I feel absolutely welcomed as soon as I come in there. So how did you get to the point of doing this YouTube thing? Did this, did this start when, you know, we went through the inconvenience, the COVID times, or is this how all that started? Yes, it started during the inconvenience <laughs> yes yeah. uh it was quite inconvenient but when i first started it i was just uh doing covers the same thing that i would normally be doing and you know and then you know a couple of originals but it was mainly just you know just that but um speaking of distro kid i uh, uh also distribute my music through distro kid and as part of that distro kid offers you a free affiliate status at twitch Yes. So I'm like, okay, I heard about Twitch, you know, but when you're an affiliate, you cannot multi-stream. That's part of being uh, an affiliate with Twitch. So you have to wait 24 hours before that content can put anywhere else. So what I was doing at the time, my streaming schedule was Twitch Tuesdays, you know, really catchy name there, right? And then my multi-streams <laughs> were on Thursdays. And then uh, uh, on, on uh, Saturday was also uh, a Twitch uh, Saturday. I have huge issues with Twitch. You know what Twitch is to me? I, I've had rants about Twitch. I absolutely appall Twitch. You know why? Because to me, Twitch is like that bar owner. You know what I mean? Like, you got to come and play my bar. It's the best bar ever. This is where you go to get heard. This is the greatest place. You're nobody unless you're playing my bar. Make sure you tell all your friends and family and bring all your people to my bar. Wait a minute. If your bar is so great, why do I have to do everything I can to rally people? Don't you have a following of your own? To me, that's Twitch as a streaming service. Twitch has no discovery, zero discovery. I stream there God knows how many times with only one or two viewers, loyal fans that were there on Twitch, and, and nothing for discovery, like zero. Twitch is the same thing. You know, we're the greatest streaming platform ever. You, you know, if you're not streaming with Twitch, you're not streaming. Make sure you advertise on all your social platforms that you're streaming on Twitch so you can bring people from those platforms over to Twitch. Yeah, yeah you probably should have started off doing a hot tub stream. <laughs> oh, yeah, that, uh, you know, except for except for this is not exactly a hot tub body that's going to really know. draw any viewers. I don't yeah. know. I, I'd, I'd come yeah. along to watch. 
Yeah. <laughs> you and maybe three other people, if that. You, you never or know. Four. Maybe it'd yeah. be the whole car crash, of, you know, appeal of it. Of people maybe. going, who yeah. is this bearded guy who's sitting in a hot tub going, welcome, welcome, I'm naked in a hot tub. <laughs> <laughs> you know, okay. Step one, I must get a hot tub. <laughs> yeah. But you, you're right, you know, um, I use my Distro Kid thing too. A lot of people don't realize that, that when you uh, release music through Distro Kid, and by the way, they're not sponsoring today's show, but they're always a part of me. You can you sign up using the uh, link up the top there and get 7% off. But as part of your subscription, you get a, a an affiliate. And it takes a long time to get that. You you yeah. got to build up a lot of people, but I did the same thing. I I was streaming on there and here at the same time, and then they really clamped down and went, "You can't do it at the same time." And I right. was like, "I better no stop." Multi streaming because, and yeah. then I thought, "Oh, maybe I'll do one stream on Twitch a week and one and do all the rest on YouTube." But you're right; it really takes a long yep. time to build up a following there. It, Unless oh you're God. playing video games, unless you're doing video games or talking politics, it seems. Yes. And and you're you, absolutely right. Yeah. Or or doing a hot tub stream and or ASMR. Mm. That works really good if you just stick a mic mm. in your mouth and go. Yeah, I don't people I don't love understand that. some of the things. My battery's about to die on my camera. I thought I plugged it in, but give me a second here sure. so I don't accidentally kill the camera. Sure, Hold sure. On one second. Well, while we were talking there, there we go. I just got a, a message, cop this, from Apple. So uh, just to fill you in, and, and people who've been following the channel, uh, what was released last week was this wonderful app here called Final Cut Pro on the iPad. And for a lot of us, it hasn't been working. So I end up contacting Apple, right? And um, they put me through to their head team of, um, of Final Cut Pro. And then they got on my iPad. Man, amazing what they can do, Apple. They got on my iPad and they removed all of the logs from my iPad to see what the problem was. And then today they personally sent me an email saying, thanks to all of your information that you sent us, we've diagnosed the problem and we've put out an update today and it's fixed it. And mm. I, I turned it on and, and what do you know? Final Cup now works on my iPad and they just tried to call me while we're doing the stream. This wow. this is how good they are, man. This is like the head, wow. the head people of the the uh, development team. Hi, it's Lester here, calling from my phone. Just following up. I sent you an email. Please let me know what's the best time wow. so we can discuss. Um, yeah, wow. Now that's service. That, now that is service. Yeah, and and people wonder why they're a trillion dollar company with shit like that. That's that's it. They they do give a shit. You can hate them, love yeah. them. I don't know. They they do the right thing. Um. <clears throat> So, uh, the pandemic hits for you, and you're you're doing covers. You were you doing yep. covers on, on the show? my live stream? Yeah, yeah, I was doing live streaming. Yeah, and you go and to then, Twitch. Um, you go to Twitch, and you find out it's a bag of shit. Yep, <laughs> and it was on a very frustrating Twitch stream because, like, the way I would always do it um, is I would always start my live streams with just an instrumental jam. The same idea with the Jack Astry, but no vocals at all. I would just run a loop. And, you know, do a little bit of guitar solo and do a little bass solo. I would always start off the show that way with just a quick jam. Get the fingers going. So I'm on a Twitch live stream that's going absolutely nowhere again. And there's nobody. So that's when I said, you know, the hell with it. what am I doing covers for? I'm just going to keep on doing these jams. And as I was doing the jams, I just gotten the RC600 loop station. That is the flagship tank of a looping station it is just the most awesome loop station with six tracks so i'm like i got these other three tracks that i can loop vocals with so that's when i started just acting like a jackass how i normally act just when i'm hanging around with friends and stuff and that's how the jackass it was born from a super dead twitch stream that i was just frustrated because there's nobody on twitch and i started doing that just on Twitch and the couple people that were there like, oh my God, this is hilarious. You need to do your shows like this all the time. Everybody does covers. Do this, do this. I'm like, really, eh? Well, okay. And so it was born. Yeah, I think I think um, we're, we're, we're definitely in an age now with streaming where people love to be involved. Like I said, one of the reasons I, I, I keep coming back, not only for your music and, and the hilarity and the, and the jackassery, but as soon as I come in, I feel absolutely welcomed. I feel like I matter 
no matter how many people are there. And I think it's really cool that you call people out and, and, uh, and make a song about them. It makes people feel special. It really does. And um, so uh, Cold Acres is going to have to look at the RC600. Yeah, it, it is the go-to loop station, isn't it, that everybody uses? I mean... Yes. I've been several communities on online that there's some people there that are having nightmares with it. Um, a bad batch or some bad firmware. I, knocking on wood right now, have not had that problem. Uh, my RC600 has worked like an absolute tank out of the gate. I absolutely just love it. I was using an RC50 up until I just got this thing not only a year ago. The RC50 has been discontinued since like, it, it, it was discontinued when the RC300 came out. And that thing's like 13 years old. So for me, it was like going from Windows XP to Windows 10, almost loop station wise. <laughs> Uh, there's the RC600, and we had um, uh, JP on, 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 who's a live looper as well too. I think he, he mentioned he uses... JP UK, uh, JP Music Music UK. Yeah, he was on. I think he's oh, on. He's a, fantastic. He was on a couple of months ago. Um, we had him on the fantastic show. Fantastic artist. And, I mean, yeah, an amazing looper as well. Yes, um, I'm normally yes. at his live streams as well, and he he was using one of these for a for a long time. I think he's changed to something else recently. Um, mm -hmm. Did you see Boss just released a brand new um, uh, thing? I can't remember what it's called. Something eight, something track eight. It's a. Let's see if I can find it. <clears throat> this thing looks amazing. For looping? No, um, no. It's but it's for live gigs. Okay. Boss, okay. Um, something eight. Oh, I'm sure it'll come up here mm -hmm. if I do it. Here it is. Yeah, this thing, the uh, the gig caster. Okay. This thing looks insane. This thing looks like a, it looks like the road roadcaster, um, the Boss GCS8 Gigcaster audio streaming mixer, but it's actually nice. made for gigs. So it it has um, vocal effects, guitar effects, bass guitar effects. It has the equivalent of a whole bunch of stuff that you would find in their flagship uh, uh, processing stuff, like the GT amp effects. And right. it's and it's all made basically for live gigs, and it has a little mm -hmm. port at the front to uh, plug your guitar in down here, as well mm. as you know jacks at the back, and it's got an SD card in it. It looks crazy, but look how much it is. <laughs> yeah, but That's you know what? I <laughs> I am a huge Boss fanboy. I'll pay it for that. Yeah, uh, Boss products mm. are the, the, they're usually built like tanks. Like my RC fifty. I've been stomping on that thing since 2006. It's it's never failed to fire up. It's never given me a glitch. It's just outdated technology. Like you know, I, I'm thinking about putting it in a glass case because that thing has done so many gigs for me. And just you know, all the other boss stomp boxes that I ever had. Just build quality is a big thing for me. And you know, they're usually built like brick shit houses. Absolutely. I mean, as a kid, I've Playing in metal bands, my setup was a boss distortion and a boss metal zone with a piece of wood taped over both of the pedals so I could click them both down at the same time. <laughs> that, that was my setup, man. I'm You're sure. using a DS1 and like a metal and zone a metal at zone. the same time? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> nice. You got to get that crunch, man. You get that, 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 that Swedish metal sound. <laughs> yeah, the Swedish chainsaw, I think they call it. Yeah. Eh? That, I got that, the Swedish chainsaw with them. Yeah. That intense nice. sound. Yeah, absolutely. Um, is uh, it. What what gear do you use in your live streams? What's the setup? Uh, is it Because uh, I see there's a few things there on the floor, not just the loop. Oh, panel. yeah. What's, oh, what? yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so I was recently... Uh, sponsored by Valatin. Congratulations. So all of my, yes, yes. And for a small YouTuber like me, because the, the channel that I do, GK Mac Music, that I do the live streaming on, it's been around since 2009. I've never really promoted it. It was always just a channel for me to put up videos of me doing my live looping so the club owners could see. It was easier, like, try explaining live looping 10 years ago to your average club owner. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. just click on the video. It's easier for you. So I never really plugged that. But my second channel, I'm actually trying to, you know, Musician Geek, where I'm doing gear reviews. I got the Valentin GP200. It's right up, you know, same idea as like the Pod Go and those other modelers. 
far cheaper, but it's absolutely fantastic. I use it for all my amp modeling, my effects. Um, basically, within that, my main guitar sound, I'm using a uh, sim of a 1959 Fender Bassman with the Fender Piggyback uh, 212 cabinet. And uh, depending on what guitar I use, if I'm using my hollow body, I use a virtual tube screamer in front of that. If I'm using one of my shredder guitars, I use a Marshall Governor in front of that for, for my gain. And uh, always using a crybaby simulator too. Now for all of my bass guitar stuff, yes, there's Musician Geek right there. Ta-da! Yeah, now for all my bass guitar stuff, I'm using a Zoom B14. It's a really good little unit, very tiny. I was using the MS60B, but having only the one switch to for being able to cycle through all the sounds was a little troublesome. So now I'm using the Zoom B14, and I'm using that for its amp models and a few effects like the overdrives, the synth sounds, and an octave sound. But other than that, everything else that's in the pedal board, like I got a Milo MIDI Audio Commander, uh, pardon me, MIDI Commander, to just be able to unlock more of the features of the RC600. And the same with the FS6 and the FS7 pedals. Those are just to be able to operate more different features of the RC600. And right next to the uh, the one white pedal, the big white one, is the obvious uh, crybaby bass wah. They say it's one of the most recognizable pedals in the world because, you know, a wah or an expression type pedal that's solid white, white, that. Yeah, that's the crybaby bass wah. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of love in the chat for boss stuff here. Cold Acres says boss mm. rules, unbreakable gear. Uh, going to last 40 years. My first multi-track was the Boss BR8 back in 2000, says Thomas Christ. Uh, Cold Acre says, I have Boss pedals from 1981, 1983, scuffed, but function yeah. is new. That is the thing. They're tanks. They are like an uh, an SM58. You can drive a car yes. over them and they will just last and last and last. Yes. Russ says, uh, Boss GT100, the secret to the delicate giant sound. Hugh Caldwell, I have the new GTX100. So... They're winners, you know. They have stayed the, the stayed the game, and um, there's a reason for that. They they outlast everything. Let's play another track. Um, if I can get my shit together, I'm going to choose one this time. I'm going to uh, choose uh, "Get What's Coming." Do you want to tell us a little bit about this track before I play it? Um, it was uh, it was a bizarre time when I wrote the lyrics for this song, where I was. A little frustrated, let's say. <laughs> I'm not going to say with what or with who in particular. I don't want to necessarily call it out, but I uh, find it's best to, if you're going to get any anger out through a creative or expressive way like this, as opposed to doing something silly, it's better to write a song about it as opposed to doing something silly. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. All right, let me cue this up and uh, let's play it. We're all good. All right, folks, this is Get What's coming? Let's do it right now. Boom. <laughs> Thank you. 
Back together, awesome stuff. Uh, Funk and good says Dennis Ellis. Man, there's a lot of influences in there. I hear, I hear like Chili Peppers in there. I hear like a bit of in, a bit of Living Color in there as well. I don't mm. know if you like them. Oh, um, yeah. Great band, Fishbone. Do you oh. like Fishbone? Oh, love Fishbone. The reality of my surroundings. I, I wore out two <laughs> copies of that back in the day. I like to hide behind my glasses. Oh man, what a great band! I saw them oh, live fantastic. here in Australia, and um, that was the first time I heard before they go on stage. Apparently, they put Tiger Bum on their balls before they play. So that's why they're jumping yeah. around so much on stage. They just put a, a little touch of Tiger Bum on their testicles. And that's why their shows used to be so energetic. Man, you got to do what you got to do, I guess, to get up in the morning. Today's show was brought to you by Tiger Ball. <laughs> what, what the Yikes. hell? It was, it was a great show. It was a oh, great yeah. show. Um, I loved it. Um, so uh, Jerry Gomes says, who doesn't? <laughs> exactly. That's That's my question. <laughs> So, uh, during, did you find during the inconvenience while you were doing these shows, did you get an influx of people coming to YouTube? Did you see it noticeably see a change in the way people were consuming content during that time? Um, I'd say an, initially when I first started doing it, because everybody was so starved for entertainment, especially where I live in Windsor, Ontario, Canada, the inconvenience was more inconvenient than it was literally in most places in the world. Canada got really stupid about things, and the province that I live in extended the lockdowns, made them far more strict, made them far longer. So when I first started doing it, oh yeah, you know my uh, you know the amount of people that were used to coming out to see me live that couldn't were on it and were all over it. But then it kind of died down a little bit and kind of normalized, so to speak. Um, once the lockdowns were lifted and people were allowed to go out and all that sort of thing. But uh, it was totally new for me. I've never really, really pushed digital content creating. And even Musician Geek, I only really started doing that when the inconvenience happened, really, for the most part. The first video was just before that, but I was still always so busy with the day job and doing live gigs that I wasn't even doing Musician Geek, you know, creating my my videos for my gear reviews and all that that much you know what i mean so it was one of those things that uh i was working remotely i was lucky that i was able to keep my job at the time because being an it worker you know working remotely is a no-brainer um but then i was stuck in the whole only 40 hours a week what do i do with the rest of my time you know i was used to going 70 hours a week and keeping occupied so it's like what, what am i going to do so i started throwing myself into making the youtube videos but then the itch to perform started to really come out and that's like okay i got to do the streaming thing i got to give this streaming thing a shot <laughs> yeah so we were i think we were locked down the longest out of anybody in the world i think we were 9 months here in victoria it was intense it was a long time and people went people went crazy and um i i, I didn't care because I started this channel because of it. And, um, you know, mm -hmm. I kind of hate people anyway. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's not true. But it's just when I leave the house, I normally come home going, wow, there's a lot of idiots on this planet. <laughs> and they seem to converge around me for some reason. <laughs> but so, so that wasn't so bad for me. Um, so, so you've been a, a, te a guitar teacher as well? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, not in schools or anything like that, but the same type of lessons that I received from my mentor, Pete Palazzolo, private one-on-one -on -one musical instruction. Uh, I haven't done it since I, uh, moved back to Canada from, uh, from Arizona. Um, but yeah, private one-on-one -on -one music instruction, guitar and bass lessons, you know, uh, when I was in Arizona, I actually got hip to the fact because a lot of the music shops in Arizona, you know, the guitar stores that you would, uh, give your lessons up they would take half of the fee 
where I think around here they would take maybe you know 30 percent or so but in Arizona it's like half yeah that's really a lot. half that's a lot like half I understand 30 to maybe even 40 percent so what I did is I put in ads in the local papers and advertised as first lesson free I come to you and it went over fantastic in Arizona like a lot of my clients because you think about it like mom, if there's a couple other kids, mom has to grab all three kids, put them in the car and drive little Johnny or little Julie to the guitar lesson, the guitar shop. And that's going to be half an hour, hour. And you got the other two kids that you got to entertain. Almost all my clientele were like, this is great. I'm cooking dinner. I don't have to leave. You come here. You teach the kids. I'm watching the other kids. You know, this is fantastic. I don't have to load them up or anything like that. And I would keep 100% of my revenue from that. The only thing was I'd have to schedule about a half an hour, depending sometimes in between each lesson for drive time to and from. And I would have to plan it like almost like a delivery route, but it worked good for quite a while. Uh, and a lot of people now have moved to online teaching because, right. and you know, since everything's opened up again, they've continued to do it. I mean, I had a doctor's appointment uh, two weeks ago I didn't even have to go. <laughs> I just had a phone call but, yeah. and, and she yeah. sent me like, like I needed uh, four, four uh, prescriptions and they all came through in SMS. Mm -hmm. I, I was so blown away by this and they all had yeah. little uh, barcodes and I just went to the chemist and held up my phone and he scanned them all. <laughs> I was like, what the yeah. fuck? Why yeah, have we not been crazy. doing this before? This is so much easier than sitting in yeah. a, I've never understood the idea of going to a doctor's sick or not having the flu or something and going in, sitting in a room and waiting for 30 minutes with a whole bunch of other people that are sick. What's the point? <laughs> We're all just, I know. I, I, I would much rather just do a phone call and get what I need and do it that way. Um, <clears throat> where are we now? Yeah. Try to stay out of the Petri dish whenever you can. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I've had the, the inconvenience twice now. I just, I'm still getting over it. This one's lasted a long time. Um, so so that, that's, that's been fun. And I was too scared to leave the house again uh, to go right. out because I didn't want to infect other people. But after about three weeks, I was like, you know what? I, I hate these people. I'm just going to go out and infect everybody. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't do that. I did not do that. But right. it, it, it ran through my mind. It ran through my right. mind. So what are your do you, what are your plans in the future for your YouTube channel? Do you plan on because I know you, you just recently you've, you've changed from doing your show normally at this time. Uh, are you reshuffling? Do you have a, a a outlay for what you want to see for the channel going forward? Yeah, well, um, the reason the schedule is changing is because of a change in day job. Um, I've recently got a different job that I'm going to be actually starting on Monday. And it's on the other side of the pond. It's in the United States. Oh, wow. It's, uh, yeah. But, you know, like I said, it's just, it's like throwing a stone. But the commute, because of going through customs, takes a lot longer. I'm going to be dealing with Detroit traffic. So I'm going to work it a, a couple weeks to see what time I can consistently get back by. Because my Thursdays uh, streams were the same time as yours, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for where I'm in the... Uh, I'm Eastern Standard Time Zone, and it was 6 p.m. I'm not going to be able to get back from my day job to start. And as well, I hate having to rush. I don't want to be like running in the house and uh, throw, fire up the cameras and get the camera. Uh, when you rush and you do all yeah. that stuff, you're not in the right frame of mind, and you always forget something or you screw something up. So my Saturdays are going to stay consistent, which are 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And while I'm figuring out my schedule, as I said, I'm going to do a lot of, uh, not a lot, but uh, the odd pop-up streams. Just last minute, hey, I'm going to do a stream. So it'll most likely be on a Wednesday or a Thursday when I come back from work and, you know, have enough time to sit down and decompress and go, okay, maybe I'll stream in 45 minutes. Because, you know, that's, that's the whole reason. I'm going to figure it out. There's going to be a regular date. And I think with said new day job, they might be giving me a couple days of remote work while I'll be working in this actual studio. So at five o'clock I log out and I can just click the cameras on and, and good go. That's all to be determined based on the way the job goes, but there's still that one Saturday. And if everybody su subscribe, keep notifications on, you never know. I might, you know, throw a last minute stream up here and there. I'm just going to call them pop-up streams. 
It's interesting you talk about, you know, being in the right frame of mind to, to go live it, because you, you really do, you know, and, and yeah. I, I think a lot of people who, you know, aren't doing live streams or running their channel as a live streaming unit probably don't get how much work goes into preparing for a live stream, you know, because nearly every day you, you think everything's right. You didn't touch, you haven't changed anything since you went to bed. But nearly every three days for me, like today, I during this stream, I went to put up my lower thirds and they're not working anymore. They're just not working anymore. Nothing's changed overnight. I have no idea yep. why. No, I haven't updated OBS. Nothing's any different. So, but this is these are the things that come up every couple of days. And, you know, there is a lot of work behind the scenes. A lot of hours get sucked into preparing for it. And if you're in the wrong so headspace... Much your shows come mm -hmm. off shit and, and it shows in the, the way people engage. And for you too, you have a lot of high energy. You're, how, how long, what's the average length of one of your live streams? Well, the minimum that I go through is an hour and a half. Like, you know, if I'm super tired, if I'm super hungry, or if I got to wake up, it's an hour and a half minimum. But I have done, my record is 10 and a half hours. I've gone <laughs> 10 and a half hours. That was largely in part to, to one of the, because whenever I stream, it's a multi-stream. I do on my Facebook page, my Facebook band profile, um, YouTube, DLive, uh, Trovo, Livestreamer Cafe, and Twitter. Now, on this stream in question, where I ended up going 10 and a half hours, one, it was a Saturday, which means I didn't have to wake up to go to work on the next day, you know, if it was a Thursday, uh, I wouldn't have been able to go that long or I would have been very grumpy the next day at work. But uh, D live featured me on the front page. Right. And I figured out basically that I was going to be on the front page until the stream ended. And I just wasn't going to end the stream for, for God knows how long. <laughs> and as well on Trovo, um, I got raided by three different people, as well as somebody opened up a treasure chest, which draws in a lot of people. So I was getting huge amounts of traffic from from uh, D Live and huge amounts of traffic from uh, Trovo, as well as YouTube. There was some people on there that uh, threw me up on their Discord server. So it was just kind of a perfect storm, you know, for a small streamer like me. And I had a lot of people in there, so I just didn't stop. I just went till 10 and a half hours until I was to the point where, you know, I stand up and like you say, it's high energy. The way I do the looping with the pedals, I'm walking back and forth to the point where my my feet were just aching so much. And the only kind of break that I did was I kept the loop going and, you know, I got the wireless headset mic as I sat down on my sofa to have a few dabs off my dab rig. But I was still <laughs> monitoring the con comments. The loop was going. I was monitoring the comments. <laughs> And, and and chatting back with people, and it was only five minutes. I did that like four or five times in a ten and a half hour stream. <laughs> so it can range anywhere from one and a half hours to ten and a half hours. <laughs> I don't know how you keep up the energy. Like you, you know, it's it's hard work. It's hard work to have new people come in and come up with something to, to sing about them mm -hmm. and and keep yep. positive and high energy with it. And and you know, you do have little chats and stuff, and the music's still playing, mm -hmm. which is cool because you need to have that. Like it's oh yeah, you, you can't be a robot and just keep that like I, I saw somebody on a, a, a stream a, a few weeks ago and I was amazed at how like they weren't being they weren't being a, an integral part of the stream for a long time but they're on camera and I was amazed at how long they were able to smile it was Valerie Bart, Bart actually and I was just like man you are doing such a good job at smiling I would I would be off camera doing making a sandwich if I wasn't you know, I don't want to sit there while everybody else is being interviewed and just sit there smiling like my face would hurt. Like, but it, actually, I have had a sandwich on a stream before. Now, that, that has happened. <laughs> uh, do you have sandwich socks? No, I got I got pizza socks, taco socks, burger socks, sushi socks, a lot of different fruits. <laughs> but but no no no, I, I I don't I don't have those. No, you I could, need to get a pair. You could play Fruit Ninja with those socks. Yeah. Um, hello, <laughs> Mr. Smith in the chat. And I see Pete Johns is here. Pete Johns is up next, guys. I will be automatically bouncing you over to his uh, podcast immediately after this show. You'll be dumped, unceremoniously dumped over there uh, to hang out with Pete for a little bit. I forget what he's talking about today. Probably something about logic. Who knows? Uh, something about logic, some kind of nonsense. We love Pete. Um, 
let's talk about gear and then we'll play a, a bit more music and then we'll get the hell out of here for the day. So we've talked about your setup, what you use for live streams and stuff. What do you use to make music? Do you have a, a particular door on your PC, Mac? What is it that you use that you go to for sketch ideas? What's, what's your organization there? Yeah, so apps and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, apps, yeah. apps, absolutely, absolutely. Um, one app that I use that it's not only used just for music creation, but my life in general would probably fall apart without this. And I am not a huge Microsoft fanboy, but Microsoft got it right with this one product, OneNote. I absolutely love OneNote. Um it's just a really simple notebook app, just like you would think, but it synchronizes well. I've never had any issues with it. I use it where, you know, I'm just, you know, a song idea pops in my head or something like that. You got it on your phone. You got it on everywhere. It synchronizes. You pop it in. It's there. I also use it for organizing. I also use it for set lists and even just daily sort of things because I can have a bit of a foggy memory. But I've uh, combated foggy memory with copious documentation. <laughs> yeah, and as you said, it's available on iOS. It's available on Android. You can see I use it as well. I have a subscription to it. Um, it is. It's one of those things that you can just open up on any device, on your PC, anything, and just dump some crap in there. Pete says it too. OneNote is my digital brain. We need things oh, like yes. this because there's so, I mean, there so many ideas come into your head every waking moment. Well, mine anyway. And I, mm -hmm. uh, if I can't get to one note, I just use a note on my notepad. But yeah, fantastic advice there. What, anything else you can think of? Yeah. And um, for a lyric app and or a teleprompter app, and uh, this actually is an app that's available for both iOS and and Android, and you can use it web-based on PC, Band Helper. Really good ah. app. I think it costs like a whole 10 bucks a year or something like that. Something like that. $10 roughly uh, a year. I found um, it. Now, yeah, it's a fantastic app. Uh, it has a lot more features than what I use it for. I don't use it for chords. I usually main it usually mainly for lyrics, and I kind of use it to use as a teleprompter for my scripts when I'm using uh, doing YouTube videos too. I use a Bluetooth page turning pedal, so that way, as I'm sitting there looking at my camera, reciting out the script, I can just hit the Bluetooth page turning pedal to turn through the pages. It uh, this app does a whole bunch of things too. It does MIDI, you know, you can synchronize the entire band off of it as well too. You know, you can run your light show along with it, but I use it uh, on its more basic core myself for lyrics and scripts and all that sort of stuff to use with my cheesy, crappy little piece of junk Android tablet. <laughs> That's what I can afford. You know, <laughs> that's that's one thing that I won't do here. I will never shame Android or other devices. You know, I, I, I talk about I talked about this on my stream the other day when I did my one of my log, late night logic shows. I, I I fucking hate, and I've never been this person. You know, who's I would post something on Facebook and go, "Hey, Apple just released this new thing, which to me is really cool, and I can't wait to start using it." And there was always this two or three assholes who just felt the need to see that post and go, Android's better. And I'd think, you know what, dude? I see your posts all the time yeah. talking about Android and not once in my brain have I gone, you know what? I'm going to post underneath that. Apple's better. Why would I shit on the thing that you like? I just don't understand it. So I'll never shit People, on Android, yeah. you know, because I understand Android's in extremely customizable. Fantastic phones, fantastic technology. Are they a little bit behind with the audio stuff compared to an a, a iPad? Absolutely. But you can still do things like it, it's still able to do it. I just, I've right. never understood it. So that's why you, I remember when I asked you to come on this show and, mm -hmm. and on your live stream, you were like, what am I going to talk about for apps? Because like, you know. I don't use Apple. Right. And it's like, hey, man, it's all cool. We don't discriminate here. Well, I get it. But, but you know, the name of your show did kind of make me think like, okay, how to app on iOS. I'm like, okay, I can come on. But no, no, I, I got you. It's just, you know, the name of the show kind of says that 
Well, uh, yeah, we're going to be talking about iOS app, yeah. right? Could you imagine if <laughs> yeah. the, the only artists I had on this show used iOS, it'd be like, well, that's 20 interviews done. <laughs> you know <what> I'm <laughs> See you next year, everyone. Yeah, no more. That is the end of dog racing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> totally. yeah. Anything else that you use? That band helper looks really cool. I just downloaded it. I oh, to, yeah. have yeah. to look into the subscription. It looks a little bit. So what have we got? Uh, eight dollars for two to five months, kind of thing. So, I'm, I'm just wondering what you get for the free thing. I'll have a look at it, and um, who knows? I could mm -hmm. end up doing a show on it. Thanks for that one. Anything else that you can suggest to yeah. us? Yeah, and um, I'm going to get into some of the stuff that I use for audio production. Sure. Um, as I said, you know, when I record, I record what I call idiot proof, uh, an electronic drum kit. You know. The via MIDI, and for that, I know a lot of people like using Superior Drummer and other things, but I am a big fan of Addictive Drums too. Yeah. I love the interface. I love the sound library that they have. Um, the electronic drum kit that I got, it's like some no-name piece of absolute junk, but as you know, it's essentially just a trigger. I'm not using any of the sounds in the module. I'm going via MIDI to the computer, and I load up a library in Addictive Drums too. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. Uh, great, great sounds. And you can get, you know, a whole bunch of expansion packs for, you know, whatever, you know, you're talking about. And yeah, I noticed you, you uh, with one of your last shows, you uh, had Glenn Fricker's pack on there, Extinction Level Event. You spoke yeah, about him actually too during this. You know, actually, he lives in the same town as me, Windsor, Ontario, Canada. Um, yeah, I kind of know him we 20 25 years ago played on a few of the same bills you know what i mean with multiple bands on them and all that sort of stuff and yeah his youtube channel blew up huge and i have sent him an email a couple times approach him going hey man you know hey, you get me on the show you, know, you want to do something and he's replied back saying oh yeah i'm a little tied up right now but uh yeah i i uh absolutely love his channel from just like what you said you know some people some people love him or hate him but I think he's doing really good with uh, telling people on certain things not to waste their money on. Like yeah. we were talking about earlier, yeah. the cheaper guitars and all that sort of stuff. You know what I mean? And I think there's a, a lot of value in stuff like that and what, you know, Glenn's doing, what you're doing, you know, what I'm slowly attempting to do. <laughs> yeah, look, is, you know, people, people focus on the yelling and the swearing and like, I yeah. swear a lot here too. You know, I know a lot of people don't like it and, and I swear and it, it's the Australian way. You know, and I, I can stop it. It's not like it's a problem, but sometimes that's the passion that you're trying to convey to people and it's not hateful. It's not like I'm calling people fucking idiots. I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm using swearing as passion. Right. But, you know, you're absolutely right. And I'm trying to get him on here for an interview. We are in talks, so hopefully he will come on. I think his information is very valuable and... He wants to save you money. He wants yes. you to create the best yes. music you can. And that's what people yes. miss. They miss that message yes. because they, they look at the aesthetics, the, the outside. Oh, he swears, he yells. And it's like, yeah, but you're fucking missing the point. Like, you, you know, mm -hmm. you, you don't have to spend all that money. Like we talked about at the, the beginning of the show with guitars. Yes. Uh, I had Hugh Caldwell, who's here in the uh, chat. He was on here for an interview as well. And he's been a luthier as well. He would testify to all this stuff. Buy a mm -hmm. guitar, no matter how much. Get it set up by a professional and you're all good. Save your money. Spend more time yes. making music, you know. The people that get angry at that sort of stuff are just people with buyer's remorse that spent. Yeah. Yeah, five thousand dollars on a Gibson guitar that has cracks in the neck joint and a bad finish. But no, my Gibson's really good because I paid the money. And see here, it says Gibson. I do actually have one Gibson guitar too, though. Uh, but mine is a Gibson Melody Maker, the cheapest <laughs> Gibson guitar ever made. <laughs> I got it for one hundred fifty bucks, and I put two hundred, uh, three hundred fifty dollars worth of EMG humbuckers in it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. was it one more app you maybe had or? Have we, uh, oh yeah, yeah. Um, a couple. Sure. Um, and for my DAW, I am a Cubase user, but we talked about this on my stream as well too. I'm thinking about going over to Reaper because of yeah. actually the exact same reason what you just said about Final Cut Pro. I heard the exact same story from a Reaper user. And people that don't know, um, Reaper is from the people that made Winamp, and they sold it, yep. and they made a lot of money off it. 
Now, as we know, Reaper is only like, I consider Reaper to be open source because a DAW for $60, it is. Yeah. six that, that that's pretty much free for a DAW. Like, come on. But I heard the same thing. Somebody that had an issue, it was 6 p.m. And they sent an email to support about an error they had. They had a error message that popped up. The next morning, he had an email back from support saying, thank you for sending in your error code. We've uh, found the problem. Here's the hot fix. We've already uploaded your system. It should be good. Please try it out and let us know. Basically the exact same story that you just got with Final Cut Pro. That's the reason I'm thinking about moving over to Reaper. Because yeah, yeah, Cubase Reaper's can sick. be very buggy sometimes. Reaper's and, sick. And, uh, yeah. And, yeah. And, and there are people out there who've had Reaper for 10 years and still haven't paid the $60. You just get a nag. Pay the 60 but, bucks. I, I know, but, but it, yeah. it is possible if you're that broke... Yeah. They have made it for you that you can just keep turning off the, yes. like um, I've paid for it. I own my Reaper copy, but I'm just saying like, even if you're that desperate, like it's still available mm -hmm. to you. That's the beauty of open source, isn't it? It's, right. it's amazing. What but, else? But the reason I'm still stuck with Cubase is because the same reason as a lot of other people, you know, it's the DAW I've used forever. I know it. And sometimes it can be a little daunting to learn a new DAW or software, especially when you already have your workflow a certain way. And yeah, but lastly yep. is my video editing software, which I think is fantastic and is completely free and completely open source. Um, DaVinci Resolve. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Love me some DaVinci Resolve. It uh, You can do so much with it as well, too. You can even create thumbnails with it because it allows you to take high resolution uh, screen captures as well, too. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. And uh, the only time you have to pay for it, and I hate the way a lot of software vendors, and I know why they're doing it, they're going subscription-based. I like pay for it, you own it, thank you very much. DaVinci Resolve, the only, uh, I think it's only to buy the Pro, like only $300, and that unlocks 4K and 8K editing. The only thing that limits you with the free version of DaVinci Resolve is... You're limited to 1080p, but most of us that are creating content and putting it online are going at 1080p anyways. Absolutely. Now it's on iPad yeah. and it's free on iPad as well, too. Like I did yeah. a show on it. It's you can pay the the uh, extra sub subscription. All it really does is give you a few more transitions and stuff like that. But it's it's incredibly powerful and it's free on iOS as well. It's a great app. All right. We are going to get out of here and hit you with my famous last question. And uh, then send it. We're going to play a track to go out with and then send everybody over to Pete Johns. Just let me make sure I've got everything queued up before we do this. If you had to tell somebody, if you give advice to somebody starting out making music, when would you tell them is the best time to start? Right now. <laughs> if you want to start, start right now and do not make excuses. If you want to start and you want to start now, just... Get at it. Just practice hard, work hard, love it, and get right down there into the sauce of it and just right down into it and just give her. Absolutely. I agree, 100%. So I want to thank you, uh, GK Mac, for coming on the show today and thank spending you. some time and, and just for everything you do. We love your show. And uh, hopefully some people have watched this today and you've hopefully if you've, you've gone over and subbed folks and I'll see you there with our rat rat bag crew and we'll see you over there hanging out and you'll get a few songs sung about you too because <laughs> it's always fun. So please, all the information for GK Mac is down in the description, his second channel, all of his music uh, through Song Whip. You can find it all there. Every single thing is all down below. Do all the clicks and do all that and... I will be super thankful for you. Thank you very much for being here today. We're going to go out today and play 24-7 because I wish you were streaming 24-7. <laughs> Jade, thank you so very, very much. 
Love your show. Thank you so much for having me. Everybody in the community, too. You guys are all awesome. You guys and gals and everybody. Fantastic community here. I've gotten so much support from, you know, Brad and Russ and everybody else that has come over to the stream. And I, I can't say thank you enough. Uh, fantastic bunch of people here. Fantastic. Absolutely fantastic bunch of people. Thank you all so very much for having me. It's been a great time. Thank you so very much. Hang on the line there, and I'll speak to you after the show ends. This, folks, is 24-7. Thank you all for being here. Remember, this weekend we I have a show coming up where I'm playing at Camp G May's channel with Brad Example and a whole lot of people. So please come along and see Stoner Fest. It's going to be awesome times. Let's get over here again, and let's play this track. This is 24-7. Remember, folks, do the things that make you happy. Mistakes make you better. And we'll all rise together. Let's do it. Oh, yeah.